You ready for some controversy? We're going to talk about fasting in this episode, who should and shouldn't do it. This topic always brings the haters, so bring it. Bring it if you disagree with us. We love that. By the way, we're going to give away our intermittent fasting guide for free to one of you lucky viewers. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below and talk to us about fasting. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Bring up some good points. As long as your comment is within the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, you enter in the contest to win the fasting guide for free. You also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Also, uh, for everybody else, we're going to make the fasting guide, which is already inexpensive, even less expensive. It's 50% off just for this particular episode. Go check it out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code IF50, that's IF50, for that discount. All right? Enjoy the show. You know what we got to talk about is one of our most popular clips on the podcast channel that gets a lot, has tons of comments, and there's negative, lots of negative comments on it. Wow. It's the one that we did on intermittent fasting. Question is from Cam the Lamb. Is intermittent, intermittent fasting ever a good idea when wanting to lose weight? No, uh, we we talked about we did a whole episode on why fasting is a terrible right. way to lose Not weight. Not with that focus. In yeah. Mind. Now, yeah, exactly. Now, now keep in mind: can you lose weight by? Let's change the word from fasting to not eating. Can you lose weight by not eating? Well, yeah, that's what yeah, happens. It's kind of a byproduct. <laughs> that's what happens yeah. when you don't eat. You lose weight. Oh, yeah, we did. Pissed it. off all the zealots. Yeah, we pissed a lot of people off because we said that fasting was a terrible way uh, to lose weight. And so people in the comments are like... What was the title of that one, Doug? Why you should not use intermittent fasting to lose weight. Yes. Uh, and there were mm. people that, oh, these guys don't know what fasting is. They're confusing it with starving. And this is what I... You know. And so I, I think we should go deeper into fasting in general and then talk a little bit about why we still think it's probably a bad idea to lose weight and well, why it's a bad way to diet. First, why don't you do this? Because I think I read some of the comments, and in some of the comments, people uh, think that we don't know what fasting is. So why don't we uh, definitely break down uh, one the, what fasting is, and then also the history of it, so we can we can make sure we address that we know what the yes. fuck we're talking about when it comes to fasting, yeah, now, and then we'll address the point that I think we made before. Yes, yeah. no, that's that's a good point. So fasting is the voluntary. Um, essentially you're voluntarily not eating. You're choosing not to eat for a specified period of time. When resources are plentiful. Yeah. So that, and that's, that's a very important part. Fasting is not, because here's what happens. A lot of people will use evolution as a way to support uh, why fasting is so good because obviously thousands of years ago, we definitely went for long periods without food, right? So you would successfully hunt not that often. We didn't kill an animal every single day. It's highly unlikely. So we probably ate very, very little until we killed an animal and then we ate a lot, right? And then we would repeat that cycle. Mm -hmm. And so humans evolved to be able to go for long periods of time without food, without really any detrimental effects. There's studies that have been done on people who didn't eat for you know two weeks, a month, and they don't see really any, and these are with healthy people, they don't see like you know super detrimental effects. And it's because we evolved to do this. But that's not the history of fasting. That is, we didn't have food. The history of fasting is is way past that. Fasting, again, it's, it's the voluntary. You're voluntarily not eating when food is available and around you. That's what fasting is. Not, I'm not eating because I don't. Because then we, would, we, could, we could label every famine that ever happened as yeah, right. fasting. Or anytime somebody was you know, a POW or in concentration camps. That wasn't fasting. That was involuntary. How many different uh, variations of fasting are there now? I know that, I mean, the, the warrior diet was- 5-2 diet. Yeah, there's the 16-8 uh, protocol. Um, which is the warrior one, right? That's warrior diet. Is, is Like is, you don't eat all day and then you eat one meal at night. Yeah. The, like there, there's a lot of different protocols to uh, what would be considered fasting. So you have the like the eight-hour window. You mm -hmm. have like multiple days. Which, what's the 5 two, 2 What's that one, Justin? You know? Oh, so there's like two days where you're at like 500 to 600 calories. Oh, okay. In the rest of the week, yeah. basically you eat normal. So it's yeah. just the low calorie days. And then there's the fasting mimicking diet. This is Dr. Uh, Longo who came up with this because of the beneficial effects of fasting on the outcomes of cancer. Walter Longo or something? Uh, like yeah, that? Dr. Walter Longo. Yeah. Um, and so what he does is he puts people on this really, really low calorie uh, diet for extended period of time, which mimics the effects 
um, of fasting. But if you want to look at the history of fasting, you have to look at the uh, the voluntary absolvement or the, the voluntary rejection of food for a specified period of time. And when you look at that, really the roots of fasting uh, were from spiritual practices. This is the oldest records of people uh, that we have of people voluntarily choosing uh, to not eat. And you find this in the, the Christian Bible, mm-hmm. the, the even the, the Jewish uh, Bible, right? The Old Testament. You find this in the Quran. You find this in Buddhism, in uh, it, pretty much every major religion has fasting as a component of that religion or is written into yeah. the religion. And some of them still practice the fasting. The practice of abstinence, you know, in yes. different forms. And so. it isn't, it, all of them, like for, for religious reasons, it's all about abstaining, right? Is that what it, they're all about? It was. It's all about the spiritual practice of abstaining and the detachment, you know, of, of worldly desires. I mean, food is one of our most um, primal, needs and desires, right? So it's like food, sex, water, shelter. And what you find in spiritual practices are abstinence from a lot of those things. Some religions will, where people will abstain from sex, right? In fact, today in the Catholic tradition, if you're a priest, you yeah. you don't have sex. There's isn't that what uh, monks, Ramadan is about too? Isn't, isn't that what that's about also? Yeah, they go through periods of fast where mm-hmm. they don't eat or drink when the sun is up, only when the sun comes down. Um, so it's, it's, the history is spiritual. There is some medical history to fasting. You can go back as far as Hippocrates, who's the, you know, the, he's the guy that, uh, came up with the quote, like, what was that? Let let medicine be thy food and food be thy medicine. Yeah. And he observed that when people went without food, that certain conditions would get better, primarily conditions that involve seizures. So, Mm. You know, back in ancient Greece, right, uh, when people had epileptic seizures, it was like a mystery. What the hell is going on? Are they possessed? We don't know what to do. And he noticed when they went without food, yeah. the seizures- Now, he Which also, uh, uh, Dr. Diom, I can't pronounce his name. Dom Diagostino? Diagostino? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, with his ketogenic protocol, had found that same thing, right? With, oh, yeah. Yeah. We've known that for a long time. We've known that- Fasting or eating a ketogenic diet, which is high fat, very, very low carb, and low protein. This is a medical ketogenic diet. Now, that diet. was, okay, so my, my point that I was trying to make was that he theorized that it wasn't confirmed until Dom's research with the seals. Is that correct? No, or, that or was, was it already Was it already confirmed? It was for a condition in diving, I believe. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, yeah but they were getting seizures, but yeah. though. They yes. were getting seizures when they would go under for a certain amount of time, uh-huh. and then I think that's what led Dom down the the, the path of actually doing the research. Yeah, because the, the rebreathers so. that they would use mm-hmm. to, yeah. to minimize bubbles right so they're trying to be stealth would it would give them too much oxygen and some of them would suffer from seizures and he knew that ketogenic diets had been used that's the first treatment for epilepsy so i have a family member with okay epilepsy. so the, in other words dom wasn't the one who pioneered no. that he just made the connection of okay we've already been using this as an anti-seizure tactic so let me try and apply this to the seizures. yes i okay. mean before uh anti-seizure medications were created. That was how you, if you had oh, a wow. child- Oh, wow, so it's been around a long time for that reason. Oh, I want to say it, it's been used medically since the 1950s or maybe even before. Because the 70s is when it got popularized as far as a diet. As a diet. Yeah, so yeah. It, it came out as a diet, I believe in 72-ish or somewhere around yeah, there. I want to say- the medical version has been around a long time. Yeah, Doug, maybe you can see how long people have been, uh, how long we've been using ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy. I want to say it's the 1950s. It might even have been- before that. And they would put kids on super high fat, low protein, low carb diets. And of course, this is before we had epileptic uh, you know, medications. And it would work for a lot of them, not all of them, but it would work for a lot. Of, and this is because when you don't eat carbohydrates and you're not eating a ton of protein, you, have, you create ketones and they have this anti kind of seizure effect. Uh, the 1920s, wow, oh, wow. Even, even before yep. that. So, so it's been around for a long time. So Hippocrates noticed this and notice that it cured this type of condition. So that's the, I guess you could go back as far as Hippocrates for the medical history. But the the history of fasting for health and fitness, it, it's all rooted in the spiritual practices. Yeah. And it comes from people practicing fasting because they noticed that it made them, uh, they would detach from things and they well, would feel better as a result. And you also see too, there's been, you know, some evidence of it, 
you know, being beneficial in terms of like cancer uh, and, and sort of starving the cancer from, you know, evolving further and like going into, you know, treatment to do that, you know, leading into treatment as well. Yes. Yeah. So now, these are all, these are all medical and health benefits that have came from it. And we've been using this as far back as like you're saying Hippocrates, but when, when was it introduced as a diet? When did it become a fad diet? Hmm. Wasn't it in the 70s when it was first used as a, as a diet? In the and 70, it's been popularized again today. In the 70s, there was like the, the wellness crunchy crowd that would do it, and they would talk about it benefiting their health, but it wasn't like a health and fitness thing. In fact, health and fitness people would laugh at it. We know this, even as trainers in the 90s. Yeah, to say, because we, I wasn't, it wasn't something that we no. would take seriously. If I, if and when I did come across it, which I don't remember the first time I heard someone talk about it, I probably would have scoffed at it in the early 2000s, late 90s, if someone said, oh, you should do this. No, they would do sk just skipping meals. That was the, one of the most common yeah. ways to lose weight, is they would say, skip breakfast, or don't eat lunch, uh, or... You know, don't eat breakfast and lunch, and you'll end up losing. That weight. says 2012, Doug. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the five-two diet. That's what, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what Justin was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I didn't hear about fasting for fitness and fat loss. I'm pretty sure the warrior diet was the most popular one that like gained the most traction. That's the one that brought it to my attention. Yeah, because I was back in the obviously this is back when I had my personal training studio. I would go on the bodybuilding.com forums and fitness forums. That's yeah. why I would get like information. And there were people talking about how, oh man, I only eat once a day and I'm getting so ripped. Now this was um, mind blowing because at the time, everything was about eating every two or three hours. Yeah. Like you had to eat every two or three hours. So it was so counter that. And the fact that people weren't losing tons of muscle by not eating all day long. Now, granted, they were eating a lot of calories when they would eat that one meal. Um, it's 2001 when that came out. That's when I it came on uh, you know to my horizon when I started yeah, kind of that's when it was like sort of mainstream. I, so I, I yeah, so I recall hearing about it around around this time, but I could have sworn when I dug into it, it got the the science that supports it came out in the seventies, mm. and the warrior diet is what made it mainstream mm -hmm. and and popular. And so since two thousand one to now, it's become this weight loss strategy. Yeah. But the science and research that supports all the benefits that when you talk about the uh, you know growth hormone and you talk about uh, cell autophagy, yeah, cell autophagy, right? All those benefits. That research, yeah, what I believe was done in the seventies. That the warrior diet pulls from, and the diet is what made it popular. It, it probably wasn't mainstream. I I, I know that uh, skipping meals and not eating for a long time was not encouraged. But you know, here's a th funny thing about that: the medical benefits, the physical benefits that are observed with fasting, are almost identical to being in a calorie restricted diet. In fact, our friend Lane Norton mm -hmm. hammers this all the time. He smashes on the intermittent fasting uh, crowd for that. Mm -hmm. That all these benefits that they tout are so amazing that fasting gives you are all similar, if not identical, to the same benefits that you get if you just are in a calorie-restricted diet for an a, a period, extended period of time. Yeah, you see the cell autophagy. You see the reduced in inflammation. I mean, it's, in fact, the reduction in inflammation from eating reduced calories and the health benefits from eating reduced calories are so powerful that even eating an unhealthy, low-calorie diet uh, makes it actually can be quite healthy in comparison right. to a relatively healthy diet that's high calorie to the point where like we know that lo like lots of sugar and certain fats aren't good for you but when it's in the presence of low calories a lot of those problems become small problems or small issues to the point where there's actually professors and nutrition teachers that have done experiments like there was one guy i don't remember his name but he was a professor and he said, I'm going to go on a Twinkie and Big Mac diet or something like that and show everybody that I'm going to improve my cholesterol. I'm going to improve my blood lipids. Because uh, you know, he just did low calorie, right? Because he just did low calorie. And I, I wouldn't go that route because I think uh, longevity of the diet is a big factor nobody considers, which we'll get into with, with fasting. Like I mean, what kind how, of nutrient deficiencies? <laughs> yeah. Know, was it gonna happen I mean, how sustainable on? is it really? Yeah. That's it. The sustainability, right? Yeah. But yeah, all, a lot of the health and, and, and medical and physical benefits, I should say, come from calorie restriction. Even the medical benefits. So- Dr. Walter Longo saw that if you just if you ate a little bit, but really reduced the protein and the in the in the carbs down quite a bit, you would still see this kind of anti-cancer um, effect from doing that. So, you know that's a, that's a that's a big one. Uh, that's a big important thing. So, let's talk about the the benefits 
Because I do think there are benefits of fasting. Like, There's lots of, you know, the irony of this is that we are doing this episode in response to people bashing us about our stance on intermittent fasting, but we actually have a guide yeah, yeah. <laughs> on I mean, intermittent we fasting. We promoted it, yeah, on some level. Uh, yeah, you know, no, I mean, out. I think that uh, we talked about it a lot, um, you know, early on when we first started the podcast, that we all have experimented with it. We've all uh, taught it to some of our clients and utilized it ourselves personally. And I, I see tremendous value in it. And I obviously will cover all the different things that I, I think. What I have a problem with, and I think you guys are on the same page, is that's not how it's being used. Or that's not the main reason why it's being or the, used. Well, the reasons that are, that are, the benefits of it are not why they're using it. That's right. They're using right. it as, as a diet. Yes. Right. It's that, and that's how it was popularized, right? If it got popular, if no, none they're of us really knew about fat. it yeah. before 01, when the warrior diet came out, the, the benefits that people are talking about is the weight loss benefits from it, which... I think we agree is the worst reason for you to do that diet. Yeah, and and before we get into that, let's 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 talk, stick to the benefits for a second. Now, it, the benefits from fasting, to the best of my opinion, based on my experience, right, trained lots of people, and even of course working with myself, but just being an experienced trainer and coach, begin and end at the emotional, spiritual, and mental benefits. So forget the physical benefits. The physical benefits of weight loss, fat loss, whatever. So it's, it's a byproduct. That yeah, that can happen from it, but that's not the benefits of fasting. The fasting benefits really are these spiritual, mental, emotional kind of benefits. By the way, not for everybody. For some people yeah. it'll actually do the opposite. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're somebody that has a you you have a lot of impulse uh, issues with food, right? So you're very impulsive every time you get stressed or anxious or bored. You eat. Uh, you're can, you have this bad relationship with food in that particular regard. Sometimes being without allows you to deal with those issues and detach a little bit from this impulsive thing, and right. then you can rebuild a better relationship. Well, any with anxiety those. around hunger in general about yeah. like have like this. I mean, I, I went through phases of that, and that's what was so mind blowing for me with, with intermittent fasting was just you know I don't have to eat you know right away and like i'm going to be okay and i'm not going to lose you know muscle mass like uh within a day or two uh because i'm not fueling my body um but you know other than that it was just a way for me to sort of break the cycle of what i felt i was bound to well even the definition of hunger many people think it's hunger when it's really cravings yes. yeah exactly. i think that's one of the the biggest things that uh i got from that even personally was you know, I would think if I didn't eat for four or five hours, oh, I'm hungry. I mean, that's, I, I got to eat. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my muscles probably falling off to your point, or I got to get some food in me. And a lot of times I didn't realize that I was just craving foods because we've built these rituals around what time we eat and what we eat during that time. And the body is craving something more so than it is truly hungry, especially if you had a very sedentary day when you probably didn't even tap into your reserves. Oh yeah. Yet. Here's, right. here's a good rule like test, right? Uh, oh, I'm starving. And then you, would you eat anything? You know, yeah, no, I'm love, actually craving. Yeah. I'm that. actually craving Mexican food right now. I'm not. You know, no, I love that. As a, I've used that, you've shared that before on the show. Where you know, when someone says they're they're hungry, and then you start listing off. Well, we could stop and grab this real quick, or I have some, I have some cucumbers yeah. and on some water over here with that. And no, I don't want that. Or no, they start turning down food. Like you ain't that hungry. Yeah, because nobody who's really hungry turns down any sort of calories. Yeah, it reminds me of like with, with kids, like with my kids, where my my daughter's yeah. like, oh, I'm starving. You know, be like, oh. Oh, cool, we have some leftover meat from last night. Right. No, 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 no. I want some of the tor tortilla chips or whatever. In the well, you're not really hungry. You just have a craving. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're not starving. Real hunger, you'll eat food. You want to have food. I know because I fasted for 72 hours, and you know anything, broccoli, fish, fruit. You know anything. It sounds good. I also know what a craving is. A craving tends to be much more specific. So it does give you a better relationship in some instances with hunger and what that really is versus cravings because a lot of what drives our food choices is based on cravings and not hunger. Well, and it's it, – I, I always try to kind of step back a little bit because we – we talk a lot to like our bubble and people that go to the gym and we talk to, you know, people that are, have dieted somewhat, but you know, there's a lot of people out there who, who have never taken a meal off, you know, yeah. and it's, that's still a mind blowing thing. They think like this drop, you know, in blood sugar or whatever is going to, they're going to like pass out and die. Uh, and you know, I've talked to even, you know, some of my parents on some level, like I had to kind of, uh, talk them through that, you know, process and, 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 and tell them, you know, it's, it's going to be all right. Well, that speaks to the benefits of just also another self-control, 
you know, just the ability to say, okay, I've decided I'm going to fast for the next 24 hours or whatever you decide to do. And you have the the mental discipline to do that. And then you start to piece together what we're talking about. That Oh, I wasn't really that hungry. So that unfolds from that. But even just the ability to uh, re refrain from eating, you know, mm -hmm. because you definitely can. And there's lots of benefits for you actually doing it. That, but a lot of people don't, don't actually do it. Like you said, they've never gone through a full day of not eating. I mean, that just sounds so crazy. By the way, them. the benefits yeah. of fasting from food that we're talking about can be applied to fasting from anything that you have right. a, a bit of an unhealthy attachment to. Try fasting from electronics, right? Take, turn off your phone, turn off electronics, don't do anything for a week with them, yeah. and then you'll also potentially develop a better relationship with them. Fast from sex, fast from video games, <clears throat> things that you may have an unhealthy relationship so, with. Anything so, impulsive. It's yeah. so great you, you bring that up because if you've been a listener to the show for uh, any time in the last two months or whatever, I brought up just a month ago that I fasted. I didn't say it. I didn't use it that word. I said I was taking a break, but that's exactly what I was doing was taking a fast from marijuana. And I, and I always want to check myself if I ever find that I'm getting out of control yeah. or I'm allowing it to drive my, my day or I'm can't, a day or two can't go by without me wanting to smoke. Mm -hmm. I never want to lose that self-control that way, regardless of uh, all of the benefits that have came out about cannabis and how much I enjoy it or what I think I have mm -hmm. balance in my life. I always want to prove to myself that I can restrict from that and make sure that I'm always in control of that. So you're right. It's, it doesn't always have to be food. And I think that's where we, we've changed this into the the all the physical benefits when really this is where the, the real meat of the totally. value of, of fasting comes and it from. Can, and it can give you a great sense of empowerment. If food rules you in mm -hmm. many different ways, breaking that chain can make you feel empowered. Now, here's the dark side of that, right? This, If you talk to anybody, and I've worked with a lot of people who have eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia, if you talk to them or you talk to experts in this, they'll tell you that what drives a lot of people to do this is the sense of control. In fact, they'll have they'll do it worse when the life around them is very stressful and things seem to be falling apart. That's when they're most strict with that type of eating because it's that sense of control. So there's a double it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? That's yeah. why fasting for weight loss or fat loss can be terrible. Because it can really encourage this bad relationship. That's the key here is do, what you're doing with your diet can either encourage or discourage a bad relationship with your food. And if you're, if you're abstaining from eating and the primary goal is aesthetics mm -hmm. or weight loss, more often than not, you're creating this kind of bad relationship where you're just starving yourself. And that's what we used to call it back in the day, starving yourself or skipping meals or not eating to lose weight. I also love uh, the awareness that it brings. And what I mean by that is like, you know, when, when you're a trainer and you're trying to troubleshoot with a client, like if they're eating certain foods that they may have an intolerance to, right? And, or yes. have an issue, their body may have an issue with. And they tell me like, oh, I had, you know, my pizza dipped in ranch for my snack. And then for dinner, I had uh, Burger King with a milkshake. And they, they name all these things that, you know, could be potential offenders. It's like trying to narrow down and figure out like, well, what the hell is bothering yeah. this person? Is it the gluten? Is it the sugar? Is it the dairy? Is it, you know, what or is it all of the above? Or is it just eating in a crazy surplus? Like you can't figure that out. One of the coolest ways to bring more awareness to how your body responds to certain foods is by taking them all away mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. taking them all for away away for a while and then as you start to reintroduce these different foods becoming aware of how the body responds because mm -hmm. the body is amazing you'd be surprised how quickly your stool will show your energy will show your sleep will show your hair your skin there's lots of indicators on whether this food that you're consuming is bad or good for you and you can't really tell that if you're constantly feeding yourself every couple of hours, it's hard to tease out, well, what was it that actually bothered me or makes me feel bloated afterwards? Well, I don't know until I get rid of everything yeah. and then slowly introduce. That's one of my favorite yeah. things yeah. about fasting. Yeah, and I think if you're somebody that is has a fear of not eating, so like I was you know, skinny, right, as a kid and I wanted to put on muscle. And so I developed this bad relationship with food where I was afraid of not eating to the point where if I went on a road trip, Got to make sure I have three protein bars with me or a shake or where are we going to eat for lunch? Got to make sure I have the high protein meal. Or, and I was afraid of missing any meal. So I had this bad connection to food in that way. Not eating for a day or two and then realizing it was okay 
boy, was that, that was great. That was great for me. And then when I went to eat, all of a sudden I enjoyed foods totally different. I had a different appreciation for different foods because of it. It wasn't all about, oh, yeah. I got to get big and, and build muscle. Another point to that is when uh, I was faced with, when I was at like a birthday party or I was at like somewhere where there was like this, and I was trying to, to be like hyper conscious of, um, you know, staying within, uh, you know, healthy body composition or I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to like, uh, you know, enjoy myself, but also realizing like I can also just not partake. Like, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> it's not like I have to, you know, because my body's on this clock, like I have to be bound to like eating at this specific time. Like I, I can break free and I could do it elsewhere. I, you know, like it was just more freedom that just unlocked itself for me. Well, and back to Sal's point, uh, I was this, definitely this kid, right? Trying to build muscle and, and get bigger and was just insecure about being skinny. So uh, missing a meal was not an option. It was like, I would I would rather eat junk food yes. and get calories in than yep. not eat at all in fear of I wouldn't get bigger. I wouldn't build more muscle. So for the longest time, that was a big... So if you came to me with all these benefits and told me how great intermittent fasting is in the early 2000s, <laughs> you would never get me to do it just because of that simple reason. Mm -hmm. It was like, I don't care if it does cell autophagy. I don't care if it increases energy, good for hormone. I don't care about all that yeah. stuff. If, if I'm potentially going to sacrifice muscle or not getting bigger because I was so insecure about that. Now, now what I know and understand to your point, Justin, is I easily can go to a birthday party and instead of eating the all the sugar and cake and candy that's just there just so I can get calories in, I'm totally okay not eating anything whatsoever, maybe not eating for the rest of the day and waiting till I'm back home again and I can right. make myself a good, healthy, balanced meal. And it is not going to slow down my progress uh, towards my gains of building muscle. Yeah, that's like road trips were like that for me. Like, oh, I have to go on yeah. a long drive. And, oh, you know, it's lunchtime. My only options are Taco Bell and McDonald's and you know burger king yeah those time slots are so arbitrary you know i think that's like one of the things like it really like I, it could be any time during, like i could just have one meal that day and like load up on calories in that one meal another great that's another great point it's something else though that goes back to the old you know every the two hour window of like you want you never want to let your body go for longer than two hours without eating in the anabolic window i was so caught up in all those things that i didn't think about it as oh wow i can just not eat for these these four to six hours that I'm driving or I'm at a party and I'll just double my dinner. Yeah. I'll just, instead of just having, you know, uh, t 12 ounces of chicken, now I'm going to have a whole pound and a half of chicken for dinner. And I never thought that way before. I was so concerned about every two to three hours getting these meals. So some of that stuff are, are some of the great benefits of understanding that. Now. Right. So if, if you're going into fasting and you're, you're going into it from a spiritual, emotional standpoint, like, okay, I've got this bad relationship to food. I just need to stay away from food for 24 hours or 48 hours and just deal with myself. And when I feel those impulses, I'll go for a walk or I'll meditate and I'll deal with these cravings without putting food in my mouth. And if you're going into it with that standpoint, you're going to come out of it typically with some benefit, right? You're going to come out of it and be like, you know what? That wasn't so bad. I was able to do that. I lasted for X amount of hours, and uh, I was able to kind of change my relationship a little bit. Now, if you go into it saying, I'm not going to eat for 24 hours because I need to lose weight, boy, is that a different mentality. And what mm -hmm. it tends to lead to, it's no different than the, the binge restrict model of dieting. This is the problem with all diets, is that they tend to encourage this restrict model that is typically usually followed by this binge model. Because here's the deal. If I'm going into it from a spiritual standpoint, it's coming from a, a place of, look, I, I want to better myself. This is something I want to work on. This is something I want to do to improve myself. When you typically go into it from a weight loss standpoint or fat loss, it's like, I need to lose fat. I don't like how I look. Uh, I'm bad, whatever. I'm going to not eat this food. Eventually, after that period, you rebel from that. And this is what the binge looks like. And, and by the way, you know, if you look at people who practice fasting and don't come to it from a spiritual standpoint, you almost always see that. You almost always see the following meal or meals or after the time is up where it tends to be in the opposite direction. The food choices tend to be not so good. By the way, one of the characteristics of binge eating, here's one of the characteristics, the speed of the food that you put in your mouth. So you tend to eat much faster than you normally would. Uh, studies will show something like 30% faster, maybe as high as 50. So it's like you're just getting it in there. 
And the food that's on the fork or the spoon is what you're thinking about, not even the food that's in your mouth. By the way, we've all experienced this, right? You're eating something, although you're in, you're, you're, you have the taste in your mouth and the food is still in there, you can't wait to swallow that mm. because what you're thinking about is the next one. Oh, especially which, chips. Right, which is a very, if you think about it, it's very strange, right? It's like, well, the whole point is to enjoy this and taste it but I can't even enjoy and taste it. It's about getting the next one in. This is one of the characteristics of kind of that binge mentality. Fasting to diet tends to encourage that. I've seen this a hundred thousand times over and over again. And again, back in the day, it was just called skipping meals. We didn't call it fasting. People would just, oh, I, I'm trying to lose weight, so I'm not eating breakfast. And then you would look at their lunch or their dinner later on, and you could see like, oh, well, the success not. rate it still falls under the diet category, yes. right? So, I mean, what what is the success rate on your fad diets? Like, uh, I think it's the it's failure like, rate is north of eighty percent. Oh, it's it got to be yeah, it's like 85, yeah. 90 percent. Yeah, so I mean, north of eighty percent fail uh, on all fad diets, and so this now falls under that category as a as a failure as a diet. Yes. Now, I don't think it's a failure as a tool for health and wellness. Mm, right. It's an incredible tool for health and wellness when used properly. I still stand by that it's a terrible diet method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also blame our space for this mm -hmm. because I know not only did the book, Warrior Diet, make it popular, but so did a lot of influencers and stuff. I mean, yeah. even people that, I remember I used to watch uh, the, the Hodge the Twins. Anabolic fasting or whatever. That's right. That became a yeah, thing. exactly. Anabolic fasting is a thing. Uh, the Hodge Twins made it really popular when, uh, on their channel when they first came out. And it was all about showing that they could eat garbage. They were eating fast food and things like that. 100%. And yeah. It, they, they, they could get away with eating bad food, you know, quote unquote bad food, uh, in these, these smaller windows as long as they were training and doing all this and fitting their macros. And so it became very popular. Oh, look at these people that mm -hmm. look amazing. They have great bodies and they're going through fast food drive throughs to, to fill their calories in mm -hmm. as long as they're eating in this window. So that's where it took off. And I know it took off. And I remember getting asked by clients about it because that's why it looks very appealing to the average person who's going to the yeah, gym. I'll and just hold shit. out for 10 hours That's so right. I can eat all those waffles. That's right. It's, it's very, it's a, God, what a selling point for a diet. Like, listen, we're not going to tell you, you can't eat McDonald's. You absolutely can have that or Burger King or ice cream. Yeah. But here's the deal. You just need to fit it in this window and stay within these calories. If you stay within these calories and you eat in this window, go ahead and have whatever you want. It'll work. And so- that is that is such a a, a bad strategy for ninety nine point nine. It's the same reason the why you know people when they get their stomach stapled, uh, you know why there's not as good of a success rate with that either. It's like now your stomach's smaller, but you're still cramming it. You haven't addressed the behaviors leading into that, which then it ends up stretching out, and then you know a lot of times like upends uh, you know the surgery. Yeah, the this, this, this studies on fasting and weight loss uh, are because people eat less calories. That's right. it. So when people have this window of eating time or they don't eat ex except for one meal a day, when you equate the calories, you find that they eat uh, less calories. Now, if you follow these people long enough, you see that they the fail rate is just as high uh, as regular diets. Now, I remember as a trainer when fasting became kind of this thing in the fitness space, right? And I remember some clients having a bad reaction to fasting, in particular female clients. I remember one woman in particular, she started exhibiting signs. So what she was doing is she was doing this kind of this one meal a day type of fast. So she would only eat one meal a day. It's now a very popular thing right now, by the way. It's yeah. called the uh, OMAD diet or whatever. One, one meal, meal a, day. a day. Yeah, OMAD wow. diet. Yeah. It's getting really so popular. So I had this client, this female client. Now I'll give you a little backstory. She's your, your typical cortisol junkie. Wanted to work out all the time, go, go, go type of individual. So this was very appealing to her. Oh, cool. I don't have to take up time eating. I'll eat one meal a day. Oh my God, all these wonderful benefits. I have discipline and control. That was what she was all about. And so she did it. And then she started noticing her hair was thinning, starting to fall out. Her mm -hmm. skin wasn't looking so good. Her libido was dropping. It was the thing that tipped her over into HPA axis dysfunction. So HPA axis is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenals. Back in the day, they called it adrenal, adrenal fatigue, fatigue, right? Yeah. It's not really your adrenals that are getting fatigued. It's really the hormone communication that starts to get off. It's, it's, a, it's being in this kind of chronic stress response, right? High cortisol in women, estrogen, progesterone get all over the place. And you get this like these symptoms of like, you know, bad hormone profile. 
women tend to be more sensitive to the effects of extended fasting than men do. Now, this probably goes again back to uh, evolution where men were the hunters and we probably did go for longer periods of time without eating. And also women's bodies are just more sensitive to those types of stresses anyway because they're always under the, the potential of getting pregnant, right? So they, the body's always like, hey, look, uh, if we're not, you know, we can survive, but we can't survive and be pregnant. So let's shut that down. So the hormones tend to, you know, respond in that way. So if you're somebody that is dealing with hormone issues, fasting is probably not a good idea. If you're a guy with low, you know, fat, chronic fasting can actually lower testosterone in some men, not all men, but in some men, it can also lower testosterone because going for extended periods without food can be perceived as a stress by the body. And if you're already on the line in your high stress already and sleep isn't good, skipping meals and not eating for long periods of time might just tip you over. Well, the, the other uh, negative that I see with it too that's very common is somebody who has, let's say, a lot of success with it with losing weight, right? So they decide this is going to be a weight loss strategy for them. They read the warrior diet or whatever, or someone, their friend did it and it was successful. So they follow it. And they apply just like most clients would apply is, is more is better, which in this case, restricting more is better. So they get in the mentality of, oh, wow, I've just got to eat this. I don't have to eat all day long. And then I have this small window. And instead of eating all the calories they probably should for their body and what it needs, they try and resist even more and yeah. stretch that time out even further. Not realizing yeah. that what they're doing is they're teaching their body to adapt, to conserve, right. to slow down slow the metabolism. Down metabolism. Yeah, no, no, no. Eating, they're doing these 500 calories to 900 calorie yeah, a day. It's just like a super low calorie diet. Right. It's and a so, very common thing I saw. With very clients. common. And, and of course, it shows uh, initial weight weight loss mm -hmm. and success when it comes to mm -hmm. that, but it, it's not long-term success. And they just made it that much more challenging for themselves when they get off this, you know, low, super low calorie okay. diet because now their metabolism has slowed down. You know what's funny? The, because people approach fitness through this, uh, you know, hardcore motivation and I have the, the, I can restrict myself and I can prevent myself from, what, what is that called? It's not discipline. Discipline is a skill. Uh, I'm talking more about like, uh, and not motivation. Motivation's a part of it, but rather, you know, the, the ability to restrict, right? The ability to just withstand this pain, right? Mm -hmm. This is how people approach fitness and health. Okay. I can withstand this sucky period of time to get into shape. This is why the diets that tend to be the most successful, not in terms of long-term weight loss, but rather in terms of sales, right? The most successful selling weight loss diets always have very few Simple. hard and fast rules. Yeah. Don't eat until 6 p.m. or don't eat after 6 p.m. or only eat one meal or avoid all carbs or eat no fat or you can eat everything so long as it's green or raw or yeah. whatever. Yeah. You'll find all the diets that sell the most are all about three or less hard and fast rules because most people approach fitness through this, okay, I'm motivated, I'm ready, I'm gonna just do whatever I need to do. Oh, cool, two rules I need to follow. I'm gonna do that, I'm just gonna stick to that. And so of course true. it always fails. So true. It fails every time because it's not developing the long-term behaviors. If you want to develop, a, a, if you wanna get into a situation where you're lean, healthy lean, long term, the only way to do that is to have these behaviors that are healthy and sustainable and relying on motivation, inspiration, mo relying on the fact that you can restrict and prevent yourself. That's short lived. It's not forever. It's impossible because at some point you're going to go through periods of time when you're not motivated. You're going to go through periods of time when you're really stressed or you don't care. How many times does that happen? You know, you know, people like that, like, you know what? I know I've been on this hardcore diet. I don't care right now because I just, yeah. you know, I, that, that shitty thing happened to me today or mm -hmm. nah, fuck it. I don't. And then what happens when you're off of it, there's, a, I forgot the name of the psychological phenomenon I talked about on a previous podcast is it's like, it's like someone who cheats on their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend, right? Like as soon as they cheat once now, and I could cheat a thousand times because yeah. what's the deal? What's the difference? I did it once, do it a million times, right? It's like, okay, I'm off the diet. Well, now I'm off. Yeah, once you so break the seal. Now screw it, yeah. right? It, it, whether I do 10,000 calories or 1,000 calories over, it doesn't matter. So that's the allure of fasting, but that's, all, that's also the problem. If you go into it for a, with a weight loss uh, goal, an aesthetic goal, you're almost you're inevitably 
going to fail and potentially create a bad relationship. Here's the people that it's worse, the worst for. If your bad relationship with food involved restricting yourself too much, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody that was borderline anorexic or bulimic, or you really starved yourself or in the past, and now you're, th now you're like, okay, now I'm going to try and do it healthy. Do not go into this. You will push you right back into where you were before. Just because no, it's named something different. I, would, I wouldn't yeah. mess with it with 90 plus percent of my clients. The, the small percentage I did play with it is in the competitive world. I actually loved, I'm, in fact, I remember when I first started introducing it to competitors. There was nobody I knew that was doing that. I didn't know a single other coach mm. that was coaching people that were getting ready to get on stage and, inter and intermittent fasting with those clients. And I did it to break up this, they have the opposite relationship with food. Yeah. They're addicted to this. They cannot go longer than two hours without being fed, that they have to have a protein bar or a shake or their Tupperware meal out, and they got to be on this schedule all the time. Mm -hmm. I love to disrupt that by interrupting their week by saying, okay, we're not eating today. All I want you to do today is if you go to the gym, it's walking, stretching day, mm -hmm. and we are not going to train. You are not going to eat, and we're going to fast. And I remember they would all freak out. Oh, my God. What about my protein? I'm going to miss my targets, and won't the muscle fall off? No, that's not how the body works, and it's not going to do that to you at all. And trust me, it's going to benefit us, and you're going to feel great the next day. And love to teach those people how to interrupt mm -hmm. their eating patterns. Yeah. And those are the ones. Or somebody that has a, a, a very... Uh, good relationship with food and diet and understand balance and macros and they've and they've been in this space and i really feel like that's got to be a lot of those the negative comments that you got from the youtube clip that we did have got to be other fitness professionals that have a really good handle on nutrition themselves and they're like right. well that's whack like, i see well, benefits we use it for all the benefits but, right you know another sort of category that annoys me and i've seen this in somewhat of like the wellness sphere and uh, just, you know, other places it's been promoted to sell products specifically about oh, yeah. like detoxing yeah. and, and, you know, they'll sell, they'll sell you some solution to go with it. Or, you know, you have to do some kind of like, you know, specific lemon, you know, powder thing and, or like, you know, habanero pepper or something to like <laughs> get these toxic uh, agents in your body out and basically exercise the demons out. Yeah. You know, you know why? It's because unless you're selling a book on a specific way to fast, how do you make money? Yeah, how do not you eating? sell it? Yeah, how do you make money telling people to not eat anything, right? You can't sell them anything. So what they did is they said, okay, here's your fasting, you yeah. know, protocol. You're not eating any food, yeah. but mix, you know, take these pills three times a day to help your body detox. I remember that was a big push it's on the BCAAs. Mm. That was a big push in our space. I, I saw coaches that were- While you're fasting, drink yeah, BCAAs. Yeah, when, when fasting became popular and then you started to see it move into even the bodybuilding world and a lot of the fitness enthusiasts were starting to promote it, uh, they were also promoting it along the lines of their you know BCAA supplements. Like, well, if you're worried about losing any muscle mass, make sure you take your drink, your <sighs> sip on your BCAAs all day long, but stay fasted. And so so we get all the benefits of fasting and then we make sure you don't lose any muscle mm -hmm. and then I can sell you this product. Yeah, or th this was a big one was, uh, you know, you're not going to eat all day, but you're going to get your nutrients. So we're going to sell you these juices, right? So it's yeah. just, uh, right. these juice fast and mm -hmm. you buy their bottles and it's really, again, it's, it's their way of capitalizing yeah. On a particular trend, because again, how do you sell yeah. anything when you're telling people to do? Yeah, at the end of the day, they're just keeping you low calorie, like everything else. Yeah. Like that's literally, yeah, it's it's the same formula. Yeah. Now, my my best experience with fasting, I'll, I mean, I I'll tell you what one of my favorite experiences was was when you know when I first started dating my wife, we went on this road trip, and in part of this road trip, we stopped at Lake Tahoe. And we were gonna we were gonna get in these kayaks. We we're gonna go across the lake, and we we're gonna find a campsite and do this whole thing. And really bringing a bunch of food. I mean, because you're you're in these little kayaks, and you're and it's like you know what? Let's just we'll have something light for breakfast, and then we'll just fast all day long. Because the point of this isn't to go eat a bunch. The point is to be in nature and be with each other. And it was great. Like what a wonderful experience. But it wasn't like hey. I know we're going to the lake to kayak. We're going to be burning tons of calories. What if we didn't eat and got ripped at this? Like it wasn't that at all. <laughs> it was all about detaching from food during this particular. Mm. This is really how I recommend it for most people. Like if you're going to fast, try meditating with it or try spending time with your kids. Or again, if you have this 
bad relationship with food where, you know, after meetings, I'm so stressed out, I go reach for a candy bar. Maybe that's a good time to fast so you can deal with your feelings. I really, I really love the awareness piece. That was probably yeah. one of my favorite things because it, you, I mean, we all remember, right? You, you were the one that started talking about your three day fast you were doing for a while there, how sensitive you are after you come out the fast. I mean, in yeah. fact, we remember recommending like having chicken broth for like your yeah, first meal right. because your gut is so sensitive. And what I love about that sensitivity, though, is that as soon as you in introduce anything that your body doesn't agree with, you know. I mean, the way you got to go to the yeah, bathroom right afterwards, signal. how it feels even going down. And it's amazing how quickly the body adapts and will figure out a way to be okay with that food mm -hmm. if you ignore those signals. So it's a, it's a really cool way to give yourself this loud signal on, you know, I know that I, maybe this could be the food that mm -hmm. is bothering me, but I'm not sure. Like, yeah. man, you clean out your system for two or three days, then you start to introduce these foods and then you pay attention and you will feel it, yeah. you know? And, and if it feels great going down, then it's probably not something that's bothering your, yeah. your gut at all. But again, if you're teetering on this like too much stress, not enough sleep, you know, kind of line, and then you fast on top of it, you, it, it your body will perceive it as more stress mm -hmm. and you will see cortisol spike. You could see more anxiety. Like what I, you know, I don't remember who said this. This was a famous uh, psychologist that talked about how some of his patients would have anxiety uh, throughout the day. And so what he recommend, and, and many of them he noticed didn't eat breakfast. So he recommended that they eat a protein and fat breakfast in the morning, and it helped significantly with their anxiety because it helped prevent cortisol spiking. It was great for insulin because it was mostly fat and protein. But if you're like in this high stress situation, overtrained, lack of sleep, and then on top of it, you're going for hours without food, that could definitely tip you over the edge into this this HPA axis dysfunction. Look, if you talk to a functional medicine practitioner and you are, and they identify that you've got some HPA axis dysfunction and it's not related necessarily to maybe something gut inflammatory in the gut because sometimes fasting is good for that or whatever. Oftentimes they'll tell you, we're going to have you eat every few hours. You will oftentimes they'll say, no, you should not go without food for long periods of time because it's just stressing your body out too much. So Definitely, do, I, when it comes to fasting as a diet, even on our fasting guy, we don't talk about it this way, it's not an effective uh, weight loss strategy. What I mean by effective is whenever we talk about something that's effective, it's Long -term. is it sustainable? Yeah. Because not eating is very effective for weight loss <laughs> yeah. in the short term. So is you know, chaining yourself to a treadmill and, and uh, you know, running for hours on end. But when we talk about effective, we're talking about sustainable it is not sustainable. It's about as unsustainable as every other diet uh, that exists, every other fad diet. If you're doing it for spiritual and emotional reasons, for detachment, for creating a better relationship with food, if your relationship with food is being attached to food, needing to eat all the time, it could be a very valuable tool. If you're somebody that has eating issues that resulted in you not eating food, terrible, terrible tool. So fasting, like any tool, um, can be effective in the positive. It could also be very effective in the negative. So, uh, what is it? Buyer beware, right? When you do this. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We've got tons of guides on everything from exercise to nutrition, guides that help you get more fit. And of course, they're all free. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So, you can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsalon, Adam at mindpumpadam. When you're telling your body to do something, it understands movement, not necessarily connection to the muscles. And so to the point we were saying earlier, if you don't learn how to stabilize and connect, you're going to develop these compensatory systems where other muscles are doing more work. And then if you push past that and you keep working out, now you strengthen 